Hello and welcome to Ocean Witness. I'm Simon Watt. And I'm Sophie Duker. And as you can see, we're both suitably attired for today's voyage to... The, the Antarctic! Antarctic. Well, Simon, I guess we've graduated from this series of Ocean Witness. Shall we? Coming up on today's programme, Hollywood stars Marion Cotillard and Gustav Skarsgård explore underwater Antarctica. We'll be trying our hands at a little bit of identifying humpback whales. Maya Rose Craig, aka Bird Girl, will be answering some of your questions. And we'll tell you all that you need to know about the campaign for a global ocean treaty. But first, it's our last chance to get caught up with the Esperanza. Do we have the webcam? Yes, we do. I have no idea what's pointing at. It just looks like the wide open sea, or is that a little bit of a peninsula think, coming out of the Antarctic? I think most of it is blue, but I think, yeah, <laughs> that's land, that's sea, that's sky. Though I can imagine it gets quite confusing when you're on board as to which is which. And it's now that time when we ask, where's Will? Last week, we found Greenpeace UK's head of ocean scaling the stern of a ship. Wherever can he be now? Today is our last day in the Antarctic, and we're spending it in Discovery Bay, diving with our remote operated vehicle down to the seabed to explore what's down there. It's the end of 11 months of solid campaigning at sea. Starting in the Thames back last April, we set sail to the Arctic, and since then it's been absolutely non-stop. I've been lucky enough to join sometimes on the ship, we were in the North Atlantic investigating the overfishing of sharks and for the last month down in Antarctica looking at the fishing industry here. But I've been watching all of it from land and it's been so inspiring and so motivating to keep on going with our campaign for a global ocean treaty. Do you think is he growing a beard? I think he has. I think the sense of gravitas over the last 11 months has given him sort of some nautical wisdom. I th yeah, I thought he was looking more and more inspired and wise. Yeah. This is the very final day. I'm sure it's totes and mosh, and they're very sad saying goodbye to all those penguins and all those whales. But yeah. Swiping little frozen teardrops from their cheeks. For this expedition, the Arctic Sunrise has been acting like a sort of floating laboratory in the Antarctic Ocean. The scientists on board were determined to gain the best possible understanding of this ocean and the animals that live there. To do this, they used a brand new cutting edge technique. eDNA stands for environmental DNA. What we're doing here is collecting eDNA from the sea. Kirsten, take away point, please. And that means that if there is a fish or a whale or a penguin or a seal that happens to have passed through that area where we're filtering water, we might well be able to detect it. The reason we're doing eDNA is because this technique uh, allows you to detect species that you otherwise won't be able to observe since they are really uh, sneaky or too small to be observed from a boat or something like that. And here from, uh, from a rub we, could, uh, we can sample uh, in half an hour and uh, do an inventory of the, of the entire surroundings just, uh, just like that with this technique. At the moment we are close to Dundee Island in the Antarctic Sound and we're aiming to take a water sample between 200 and 300 meters depth and that water sample we're going to test for eDNA. Well these samples are going to give us a slightly different DNA signal from any, any samples that we've taken at the surface so we would hope to be able to estimate say fish species richness right from down at depths 
and those species will be different from those living at the surface. Now I'm just constantly adjusting the speed of the vessel so that we are not dragging the cable to forward or backwards, but the cable should be vertical in the water and free of the side of the ship. So this is why I need to constantly adjust the speed. Awesome. All of this research is really necessary to, because we need to be able to understand what lives here. You just need to look around you and realise that there's, it's such a unique place and it's hugely productive, yet it is still vulnerable and we, have, we know that the impact of climate change, fisheries, all sorts of threats are facing these species here. So, you know, this is providing baseline research is kind of the first step in moving towards a really strong ocean protection treaty. Yeah, it's brilliant because you can see those things and then they also now can see those sneaky ice fish. I'd love a look. Oh, yes, I like <laughs> sneaky makes it sound like they're being deliberately elusive, which yeah. for all we know, they are. Anyway, Dr. Kirsten Thompson is back from the Antarctic and here in the studio today. Hello, Kirsten. Hello. How are you doing today? Well, missing Antarctic, for sure. <laughs> it's a I, lovely place, I very special. How, I don't know how normal life compares to that. Like, last shot was, like, breathtaking. It even doesn't. when you're just... <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us what was your reason for being there? What did you want to find out? So we had a whole load of different things we were researching on the sunrise, so quite a sort of diversity of sampling processes and, and methods that we're using. So we're using eDNA, which you were talking about, which is kind of filtering water and then trapping this sort of free floating DNA that's in the water. But how exactly do the animals leave their DNA behind? Well, it's really just sort of snot, poo and <laughs> skin cells. So oh, as, as like, <laughs> yeah, the big three. I mean, as a, as a fish swims through, they're always sort of sloughing off skin or mucus from their skin or pooing and all of that material contains DNA from that animal. It's giving you a really disgusting snapshot of oh, everything yeah. in the ocean. Right yeah. There, <laughs> yeah. Like a very sophisticated pooper scooper. Just kind exactly. Of... Right. Yeah. And then you preserve that DNA and then we take it to the lab and sequence it. So I know some of the findings from the Sargasso Sea have already come back to us. Yeah. So from the Sargasso Sea we already know that the results showed spotted dolphins in one location. Um, also, weirdly, some deep sea eels, so a deep sea sort of cusk eel, um, and some deep sea um, fish, like lanternfish, anglerfish. And why is it so important to know what species is passing through the particular environment? So I, I think, as a, as a scientist, you really need to know where animals live mm. and when, um, and then it helps you understand, well, if this area is really important for that particular species, then we know that we need to protect it. So that's really why um, eDNA is just another method that we have in our toolbox as biologists to try and understand well, what does live in the oceans. And if we create sort of big databases of what species live where, it means it helps us monitor changes over time when those areas are changing. eDNA wasn't the only technique that you were using. Could you tell us what else there was? We were uh, using hydrophones to monitor for whale noises. We were doing whale ID work on humpbacks specifically. Um, we were also collecting water samples to identify whether there were microfibers or plastics in the waters. Um, and then also collecting water and snow samples for um, testing for PFAs. Those are the kind of chemicals that are in Teflon or in waterproof mm -hmm. clothing. So we were doing a whole range of different sort of um, monitoring methods to look at the ecosystem in, in Antarctic. But when you were actually there, could you see the human impact? Um, what was it like being there and could you notice any? It's quite amazing that such a pristine area has, even in that, that really remote region of the ocean, there are plastics that reach there from, you know, washing clothes somewhere else in the world you know, and, that, and the ocean currents 
move that pollution to such a pristine area. And that really kind of illustrates how, you know, we need to think about the oceans as one ocean and and really protect it as one ocean. So this, you know, idea of a of global ocean protection is just really, really important. And it's obvious when you go to such a remote area and you see that our actions elsewhere are impacting these, you know, really quite important areas of the seas. I guess this is what everyone we've been talking to has come back to, that we can't have a fragmented approach. It really needs everyone to be connected yeah. on this. Yeah, exactly. You've got to do it as much more of a global approach. Now, in your Antarctic research, you had two celebrity assistants in the form of Marion Katia and Gustav Skarsgård. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? They were fantastic. I worked them very hard and they did a very good job. <laughs> Let's see how they got on. It's the most beautiful place I've ever seen. Especially this place called Paradise Harbor, where we anchored for a few days. It's just spectacular. The ocean was completely still uh, and everything was like reflected in it as a mirror. Incredible. Okay, let's do this. There's something magical about it. So your imagination does the rest. So basically what you're doing is you're recording the sound from underneath the surface. Yeah, so we can just pay out this hydrophone and it's about 20 meters in length. So we can basically listen to the sound of the ocean under about 20 meters depth. We might hear the ice and we might hear just the sound of Then it sounds like streaming water, like trickling water. The ice is kind of cracking and shifting. And then the air that's trapped inside, it just releases and you can hear it. Yeah, beautiful. Amazing. It's like an unknown world. <laughs> How the human sound affect uh, the animals here? Right. Well, if you have a lot of shipping, a lot of big ships moving around, make a lot of engine noise, and that means that the, the ocean just become a really noisy place for all the animals that are, are feeding here. They won't be able to communicate in the way that they would if it was a quiet ocean. I think it's interesting that we learned when we were kids that the forest is a place that is very important for us to breathe. I never learned that the ocean were as important as a forest. Even though I've seen the impact that we have on the environment, I still feel more hopeful and also, again, inspired by nature. It's still out there, it's not too late. I do believe that, that nature has, a, has the ability to heal itself if we just let it, you know? And um, so I'm, I'm sort of inspired on behalf of, of Earth. I want to go and be friends with some penguins now. I, th I think penguins are amazing. My favourite thing about them is that when they're in the water, they're obviously very graceful, but then when they've got their fins back and they're sort of picking their way over the rocks, they look like they're doing a sort of 
tightrope walk. A shimmy. A little shimmy. Mm. A sexy penguin shimmy. I'm a big fan. I know. Well, now, Kirsten is going to take us through our whale spotting paces as we're going to play a game that we like to call Which Whale Owns This Tail? Can you please talk us through it? <laughs> so, when you're studying whales, what you're interested in is you're looking at movements of individuals and then you're also looking at movements of individuals right across ocean basins sometimes. So humpback whales, when they dive, when they're feeding for instance, they will lift their tail fluke up like you saw in that end of the video yeah. and the pattern on the bottom of their, their tail fluke on the underside is unique for each individual. So it's like a bit like a fin fingerprint really. So as a biologist, you take a photograph and that can tell you exactly what whale you're looking at. And then you can add that photograph to a huge global database of photographs. And then you can identify whether that whale's been seen in another area of the ocean or at a different time. So this whale here, so that was seen previously in uh, Bramsfield Strait in, in Antarctica, and then we photographed it when we were in our expedition down there on the sunrise. So you can see where, which, well, I'll give you this whole bunch of whale flukes, and you can see if you can spot it yourself. Amazing. Thank you. So this is kind of like the, the lineup shots in a way. These yeah. are the things you've taken they're like before. Sort of, they're a little okay. bit like mug shots. Well, it's not oh, that one. Not that one. Is this competitive whale tail snap? Like, are we racing? It is. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm competing. I don't know if you are, Simon. I think maybe this guy. Oh, you're good at this. It's yeah! <laughs> beginner's luck, surely. Come I on. knew I had a talent, and luckily this is my talent. <laughs> Got your eye in. Yeah, I mean, if I was matching this, I would be looking at all these different markers. So, you know, the fact that the border's all black, that's mm -hmm. kind of unusual. And then you'd be looking at sort of like this little scra scrape here or little blobs here. And then also you use the trailing edge, so there'd be a certain pattern to the trailing edge as well. Oh, well, okay, that was, that was just beginner's luck. I want to I wanna go now as well okay. and see what else we have. Have any more? So we got this one here, which is Ooh. really exciting whale. So this guy, or he or she, this is a photograph taken from the Gulf of the Chiriqui off the coast of Panama. Mm -hmm. And that was taken in 2012. So I was really excited when we got this result because we photographed it again in our trip, 2020. In between, it had been seen again in, in Antarctica in 2017. So you see if you can find it in amongst our whales, because this is actually a very important whale for us because we actually named it Mia after our really talented radio operator on board the ship, who, whose birthday it was when I found out that we had this really incredible, exciting match. So Panama to Antarctica is a long way. This is a globe-trotting whale. This is, yeah. I thought that originally, but I don't think so now, actually. There's a couple of things mm. not quite right. Definitely not. Definitely mm. not. Mm. That's actually yes, because it's a different angle. Yeah. Could that be the match? That's the one. That's me. Yeah. yeah well it's done. got scratches. In your face. Yeah. I'm actually furious that you've got that. <laughs> and this is really important result because we now know that these whales. We know where the breeding ground is, and we know where the feeding ground is. And that really shows that we have to protect their whole area of their distribution, not just one area. And that gives us another reason for protecting the global oceans rather than mm -hmm. just doing little, little patches. So, yeah, this whale needs it. Is there anyone else who can use this database then? Not that yeah. you put in the work for it, can, I don't know, just say some tourist that happens to yeah. snap a whale? Yeah, the online database means that anybody who sees a humpback whale or another type of whale can take an image and then crop it, get it, have a location for that where you've taken that image, and then submit it onto this online database. And you can be doing your own whale research. Amazing, it's like an extreme where's Wally. Exactly. Where's, where's Willy? Willy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Kirsten. Now, while Kirsten's team were conducting science on board the Arctic Sunrise, the Esperanza was home to another team of scientists. These people were penguin specialists, and they were there to survey colonies that had not been studied for decades. Come 
Counting penguins at its core is pretty basic. It really is one, two, three. You've got to count them one by one. Even if there's a colony of tens of thousands, we go through and split them all up. We actually count them all three times to try to get a count that's within 5% error. Why do we count penguins? Well, penguins are great bioindicators and they are, they'll tell us what the health of the ocean around Antarctica is because they eat krill, krill eat phytoplankton, can't really adequately count the phytoplankton, it's really difficult to count the krill, but we can count penguins because they come ashore every year to these same places. Chinstrap penguins, which are in some ways the most unknown species of penguin on the Antarctic Peninsula. Elephant Island is a key piece of the puzzle because they have already been surveyed in some other areas. But here at Elephant Island, there's been no surveys in the last 50 years. So that's why we particularly wanted to come here. Doing these hand counts even now is important because it allows us to put our observations into this long-term data set with similar techniques that have been used in the past. So you can really look at apples and apples and figure out the trends over time. We're using cool stuff now, like we've got drones. We've got a drone team here with us flying these same penguin colonies that we're counting by hand. We start with a very well-defined survey and take images all of, of the whole colony. Then we use the software to put all these images together in something that we call the photo mosaic. The photo mosaic captures thousands of images into one big picture. And then we can either use manual counts on that big picture or make small pictures out of that big one and feed it into some machine learning algorithms which can do the counts for us. From what we can tell so far, the chin straps have declined quite a bit on Elephant Island in the last 49 years since that last survey in 1971, even by more than 70% in many of the colonies that we've been surveying. Who knows what the reasons for that could be? It could be climate change seems to be the main theory these days. It could be uh, something to do with krill fishing in this region as well. It could be something else, just changes in sea ice cover or something like that. But it's uh, a little bit concerning to see such big declines in such a short amount of time with these penguin populations. So it's a lesson for us because we either are going to heed this example that we're seeing down here in the Antarctic, or we won't. And we'll suffer the consequences just as, unfortunately, the chinstrap and Adelic penguins seem to be doing down here. We have the ability to change, and, and we should take serious measures to do so. What we have to remember is that in all of those uh, scenes and in all of that footage, it smelled disgusting. Yeah, if smell vision was a real thing, we'd be knocked over right now. Well, now that all the surveys are complete, some colonies were found to have declined by almost 77%. And that's not just bad news for penguins, it's also a sign of the health of our oceans. Your questions this week are all about penguins and joining us to answer them is Bird Girl. Maya Rose Craig is an award-winning bird watcher from Bristol who joins us now via video. Hello, Maya Rose. Hi. How do you become an award-winning bird watcher? What do you have to do? <laughs> So I've been really lucky and I've traveled a lot, including to Antarctica to see penguins. And I've now seen over half of the world's bird species, which is amazing. That is incredible. And you said that you went to Antarctica. When you were in the Antarctic, you came into contact with penguins. What was that like? Um, it really was amazing because penguins, I guess because they don't have land predators, they're just not scared of people so they were absolutely fine with waddling around us like not paying us any mind and for me it was fantastic to just be like so in with a wild animal essentially yeah up close and personal that means you're the the perfect person to answer our questions do penguins have any predators sarah in brussels wants to know um yeah they do although it is mainly sea-based predators so they're very friendly on land 
to humans that come and visit them because they don't really think of them as predators. But in the sea, in Antarctica, they have two main predators, which is the leopard seal and the orca, which I think are both like very scary when they're chasing you down through the water. Well, Diana from Germany wants to know, what is the most impressive fact about penguins? Um, my favourite fact is that emperor penguins can run up to about 14 kilometres an hour, just because I think that it would be very intimidating to have a penguin running towards you at that speed. Especially an emperor. I think just <laughs> the way that emperor penguins have learned to survive in like very severe Antarctic conditions is amazing. Pauline from Germany, a romantic, asks, do penguins really stay with one partner all of their lives? They do, yeah, which I think is really sweet. And in some species of penguins, they even propose with a rock and they have to find the best pebble possible to impress their partner, which I think is really cute. You need a real impressive rock. That's that cool. That is amazing. Do you know, I'm just interested in this, is there, is it always like the penguins of a certain gender that propose or is there like one day every four years when the female penguins can propose with a pebble? <laughs> I think it is like most bird species, the male penguin that's trying to impress the female. Sue from Istanbul asks, how do penguins stay underwater for so long? So penguins have to hold their breath while they're swimming. They don't have gills so their body has specially adapted and even though on average they stay underwater for about six minutes they can swim for up to 20 minutes and when that happens their organs that don't need to be running start to shut down and they only have like their heart and their lungs going to just like make sure they can last as long as possible basically hmm. so prioritizing that's fantastic Thank you so much, Maya Rose. Um, good luck seeing the other half of all the bird species. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for having me as well. Hello. And now it's time for Life on Board. And in honour of International Women's Day, we're going to celebrate many of the incredible women on board Greenpeace's ships. Soy Samantha. Soy de México. Soy Deckhan a bordo de la Arctic Sunrise. My name is Usnia Granger and I've been sailing with Greenpeace for about 13 years now. Hola, soy Sol, Deckhan del Arctic Sunrise. Algo que está buenísimo de, la, de esta expedición es que somos un equipo en su mayoría mujeres, haciendo ciencia, manejando botes. Creo que es una muestra de que podemos estar en todos los ámbitos. We have women captains and women jeffo drivers and women engineers and absolutely, yeah, definitely, come. I would love to sail with you. Para mí significa que se están rompiendo estas barreras o estos estigmas que se tenían de solo las personas fuertes y rudas pueden estar en un barco. Trabajamos con distintas mujeres de distintas partes del mundo y eso es súper enriquecedor. No importa tu estatura, no importa tu fuerza, en realidad con diferentes habilidades podemos aportar al trabajo que se hace en una expedición como esta. Poder mostrar eso es uh, impulsar, eh, inspirar a más chicas a que lo puedan hacer. Uh, I feel just really excited that my job is this. 
It's yeah. pretty pretty cool job. Yeah, and it's amazing. Also, it's just all sorts of people from all over the world doing great things. This yeah. really is going to take everyone. We've seen like women and non-binary people. We've seen people from a range of different countries and backgrounds, and it really does feel like the oceans belong to all of us. Yeah, working together for a common goal. And to that end, um, well, this has been the end of a, a long journey for us too. Yeah. What's been your favourite bit of the series? Well, I guess at the end of all things, my favourite bit was actually right here in the studio when we met uh, Gav, Gavin Strange from uh, Turtle Journey. Uh, oh. I think it's really cool that so much amazing work is being done on the high seas. But for those of us that can't actually physically get out there, having something created that has those moments of deep uh, doom and gloom, but also levity and hope, <laughs> <laughs> all told by a tiny little turtle character, I think was my favourite bit. Yeah, what about you? Why. Uh, for me, I, I think it's finding out about the, the science because I was very much before doing this show aware of Greenpeace's work as, as campaigning, as trying to win the hearts and minds of people and share some of the big troubles that our, our planet is facing. But to discover that they're hosting scientists on these ships as well, that they're inviting people on board saying, hey, come on our trip. We know you don't get to go out there very often. You don't get to go to the Arctic and the Antarctic. So there's that. But if there's going to be one character for me, it's definitely the scaly foot snail. I knew you'd bring them back. Scaly foot, old scaly. Any excuse to talk about a snail, I'm on it. But enough about us. Now it's time to hear from the people who are actually there. Pole to Pole has taken me from my shores through the North South Atlantic. But getting to see this beautiful and fragile Antarctic wilderness has been the most special moment and the most convincing that we really need to protect our oceans now. My favorite moment was when I saw the penguins for the first time and I was like, mm, so happy. My most memorable moment has been actually uh, discovering sargasso fish. It's a little tiny uh, fish that lives in sargasso and that his fins actually resemble fingers and actually is clinging into the branches of the sargasso and this is the ecosystem where uh, this fish lives. I took part in the West Africa leg of the pole to pole and one of the memorable moments there was after being in Dakar and having quite um, vibrant uh, open boats there, we left and we had a flotilla, as we were departing we had a flotilla of fishermen come out and it was actually raining and I was amazed to see how many of them came out and with their banners and waving, and it just felt like we were all working together to try to protect the oceans. And it was, yeah, it was really inspiring. Maybe it's the moment that will stick out the most for me is when we saw these huge sharks being pulled out of the ocean. And it just made me think there is no one out here on the sea documenting what's going on out here. And it made me very proud to be a part of an organization that's doing that. I can't believe I'm the only person to mention the scaly foot snail. Yeah, I, I feel like it's shocking it didn't end up in more people's highlights reels. Mm -hmm. Now, the pole to pole expedition might well be drawing to its end, but that does not end the fight campaigning for a global ocean treaty. No, and to talk us through what happens next is Greenpeace Oceans campaigner Julia Zanoli. She's here, right here in the studio. Hello. Hey. You've just come back from the Antarctic, haven't you? Yes. How was it? It was. Brilliant. It was the most beautiful oh. thing I've ever seen in my life. Oh my God, everyone's come back and they're just sort of like starstruck or eye struck with like the beauty of it and how special it was to be there. Are there any moments that stood out from you? I think being able to facilitate scientific research uh, with everything that's going on in our planet right now for me was very special. Yeah, we have the evidence, so now we should act on it. So to that end, what comes next? So now we're waiting for governments to get together um, and finalize this treaty. It has been years in the making. This is, we have been following those negotiations for a long time, but we do believe that now is a unique chance for governments to come together and do something good for our planet. This can be done. All that we're missing is the political will to do so. So that's why it's very important for people to put pressure on their governments to make noise for ocean protection, because what we want to avoid is that they feel that they can do those negotiations um, under behind closed doors. Like we want to make sure that they know that the world is watching while they negotiate this treaty. 
If this happens, it'll be good for the oceans, but not just for the oceans, because this is a big part of our planet. What kind of knock-on effects might we see? So the oceans are critical for the climate. Uh, every second breath we take comes from the ocean. So um, they have a very important role in sinking carbon. Um, I think many people talk about the role of forests um, in, in this context, but uh, the role of oceans is not that well um, understood for many people. So we all need to act now. We want to protect the oceans, but what can we all do to help? So we have a petition. This is um, a first step. Uh, it does have a political impact. It is something that we can use to make uh, pressure in, in, in governments and politicians and to show that there is a global movement of people that are concerned and that really want to see our oceans uh, protected. Put pressure on your politicians, on, on ministers, on governments, because they need to know that we care about this. This is the only way of making uh, of changing things is, is to make sure that our voices are heard. Thanks so much, Julia. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it for this series of Ocean Witness. Thank you so much for joining us and for adding your voice to the campaign to protect the oceans. Please keep giving your support. And we thought it only appropriate that we should give the final word to the whales. But from us, for now, bye. bye.